this great tutorial. I'm going to do it on uh, mining this time. Um, so it, and it's a bit of a follow-up to our other discussion that we had on mining. So it's a bit of a tutorial and a discussion on mining. Huh, this camera is still messing up. I'm going to change the resolution down or the frame rate. Let's go to. Uh, it looks so bad like that. I'm just going to leave it and see how it goes. Anyways, so um, we did the mining over the weekend, Fourth uh, of July weekend, and the customer, I mean the the uh, the person that we work with here, he bought a lot of the uh, parts, had them delivered to him, and got got and they got to him just in time. Um, there's a big run on mining parts for those who don't know right now. Um, one of the things that we did not really emphasize in the discussion and probably made a lot of misstatements on, frankly, um, was we probably often mentioned uh, Bitcoin mining or Litecoin mining. No one, and by no one I mean like civilians, regular people, no one is mining Bitcoin or Litecoin for profits right now unless you're using something called an ASIC. So what you'll see, what I'm about to show you, are some screenshots, because he didn't want to do a video at the time, but are some screenshots of uh, mining equipment that uh, we purchased. And um, you'll see that a lot of this hardware might seem a little bit excessive for uh, the goal, which is to mine, let's just pretend it's to mine Bitcoins, to mine Bitcoins. Um, and that is very, very, very true. And so what one of the manufacturers did in China, or whatever, one of the hardware manufacturers for computers, he stripped away all the stuff necessary except for a, the bare minimum which was required to mine Bitcoin and Litecoin because they share the same computational methods. So this fella, he got these parts uh, and to produce the same amount of power the same amount of computational power that uh, what we spent maybe or what our associates spent maybe two thousand dollars on to get a whole, a whole lot of the equipment uh, to get that same amount of computational power for two thousand bucks these other people they might be spending um, roughly about the same there's they're spending roughly two thousand as well but the ongoing electrical cost for us, it will probably be in the nature, uh, or for him rather, it will probably be in the nature of $500 a month, $400 a month. And for them, it might be $150 a month, maybe a fourth of the, the power or so. Um, and that's due to ASICs. And ASICs, uh, I should have grabbed what that stood for at the start. I'll look that up now. But ASICs um, are essentially a type of graphics card which is what's used for mining not the processor power but the used graphics card um, and a regular graphics card can be used for playing video games or doing a variety of things whereas an ASICS cannot be used for video games it can only be used for one purpose and that purpose alone which in this case is Bitcoin mining so um, anyways ASIC stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. Application Specific Integrated Circuit. So you'll see ASICs in all kinds of high demand circuitry. It's not just Bitcoins, but as far as, at least as far as I know, but uh, Bitcoins, it's become very profitable to do ASICs only for Bitcoins. Um, does that mean that as a consumer I should buy an ASIC? No, not at all. The resale value is not there. Uh, the alternative use is not there, and and again, you're competing against the most uh, industrious miners who primarily live in China and get the parts at probably half the cost that you'd pay, the, industrious, the most industrious miners. Now, essentially all other coins mine in a different method, and they don't use the Bitcoin or the uh, Litecoin computational methods and they're not set up to work with those uh, with those systems Litecoin is and anybody has the option to put themselves available to the Bitcoin method 
But if you make yourself available to the Bitcoin method, like let's pretend Ethereum was available uh, via Bitcoin mining, then the Bitcoin miners could just kind of jump back and forth and mess with the Ethereum blockchain because if all the Bitcoin miners chose to do so, there's a lot more uh, ASICs or Bitcoin ASICs out there than there are um, new Ethereum adopters. So most of your new coins or your alternative coins will rely upon graphics cards because graphics cards have a higher resale value for individual users. Um, they have an alternative use if you ever choose to not mine Ethereum or not mine Bitcoin or if you choose to play video games during the day, mine at night so you can do behavior like that and you don't face the threat of the Bitcoin miners uh, screwing you over by pulling all their ASIC mines and attacking your blockchain. Uh, they call this forking, hard forking type of behavior uh, to let people know. Soft fork is when you vote through the system so you can think of like a presidential election as a form of a soft fork and then a hard fork is where you essentially unplug and replug the machines in with slightly different information in them or changed information and you can think of hard forks as revolutions so hard forks are essentially like let's just call it always bloody they take a long time they take a, a lot of uh, a lot of consensus to achieve a hard fork and it's, it's always very difficult and then uh, soft forks uh, are much easier um, they don't disrupt the system near as much. The system's intended to have soft forks. This is the option to upgrade the system that you're buying is through the soft fork system. And they don't change any, they don't retroactively change the data as far as I know, soft forks. You can only retroactively change data by unplugging every single system and then plugging them back in. Um, and then you can kind of do stuff like that. But it's still known that you change the data. It's just that everyone agrees to it. The one that you hear about most often is the DAO, which happened in Ethereum. And this is when um, Ethereum was a small altcoin. Um, it was still bigger than the others, but it's still small at the time. It might have had something of a $300 million market value at the time. And one of the users... Uh, one of the major investors had roughly a hundred and fifty million dollars. So roughly um, Well, it's about six hundred million dollars. They, they had roughly uh, Ten percent of all Ethereum outstanding So today that would be worth about two billion dollars, but at this time they had a um, uh, hundred and fifty million dollars total so um, Someone stole this someone cracked this guy's system and uh, in Ethereum you can write smart contracts this guy wrote a smart contract so that he could get his hundred and fifty million dollars uh, divvied out to a, a whole group of users you could think of this group of users as coinbase users but it's called the DAO just to be clear um, so this guy had let's say 10 percent of the Ethereum roughly hundred and fifty million dollars and Ethereum was worth uh, about 900 million at the time. And so a hacker um, found a mistake in the code to the, soft, to the smart contract that the uh, user had created for himself to distribute his 150 million. And the hacker took 50 million of his 150. And the code was in place you can't change the code and so the hacker would have had access to eventually take the rest of the 150 million once the first 50 million went through and then likewise um oh, what was it well anyways so the hacker would uh, have the option to take the rest of the money had he wanted to um so the investor who had roughly 10 percent of all the ethereum I uh, spoke with Vitalik and all the others and all of the community got involved and just to be clear the investor was not one guy with 150 million he represented maybe uh, let's just call it 3,000 other people or a thousand other people who might have each had 500,000 each in, in the in big investment pool so this guy spoke with Vitalik and all the rest of Ethereum they had a big vote and uh, Vitalik did not like the idea of 
a hacker or an extortionist um, of blockchain technology having what would be worth today two billion dollars because his feeling was that if he made two billion dollars from his first attempt to crack blockchain it, which he did not crack the blockchain he just messed up a user basically a phishing a, a phishing attack type of uh, method but if uh, if a one of his early adopters and users falls victim to a phishing attack and loses uh, ten percent of all Ethereum or two billion dollars today approximately, um, then Vitalik did not like this person having so many resources to go against all other blockchains in the future. Um, some people, especially in the Bitcoin community, they'll talk about how. Uh, They'll, they'll start talking about how well he won that money fair and square, but in the real world, it's not what you want to do. You don't want to have someone like point a gun to your head or whatever the case and say, give me all your money. And you're like, you know what? You have the gun. I didn't think about that. Fair is fair. Here's all my money. You deserve it. What you'd prefer to say is let's rewind that and just, just pretend you didn't do that and I'll call the police in or whatever. We'll have a community decision and see if the community wants to do this. Essentially, you would have had to restart all of Ethereum, which which Vitalik and the community chose to do. And today you have Ethereum, which was after a hard fork. And then you have something called Ethereum Classic, which was the alternative hard fork. And within the Ethereum Classic system, there is a hacker, fisher, attacker who has, I don't know how much money, but maybe a billion, maybe $500 million in the Ethereum Classic system for the people who supported Ethereum Classic. So this attacker got maybe $500 million or so. And then uh, if he held his Ethereum and allowed it to appreciate, his Ethereum Classic and allowed it to appreciate. And so, uh, Hard forks are always what you might call contentious. If there is no Ethereum Classic, then Ethereum would be worth a lot more. The investors would be a lot happier. And likewise, um, oh, competing code. All the code that Vitalik and the rest of the Ethereum Foundation makes for Ethereum works on Ethereum Classic. So every time there's a hard fork, the old people benefit uh, from the hard fork because they can just steal your code afterwards for free essentially without a research team so litecoin more or less is using a bitcoin technology and bitcoin systems and their main purpose is just to be there when the bitcoin network is too busy or clogged up or they're too big to improve their system and the main thing that they're talking about right now sorry I'm going on tangents but the main thing they're talking about now is the Lightning Network, which in the Ethereum uh, system, they call it Raiden. And Raiden and the Lightning Network, they serve two purposes. And that is to, um, they, they can speed up transactions significantly. Um, whereas if you use Ethereum or Bitcoin at Walmart, let's say all of you are paying in Bitcoins and Ethereums at Walmart and each transaction is run through the system in the Lightning Network or Raiden system for Ethereum. Walmart will take all the transactions done throughout the day more effectively. Take all the transactions done throughout the day, bundle them up into one, and send it to the Ethereum network. This is not to be thought the same or similar to sharding. It's It has a similar purpose, it's a kind of similar goal, but it's it's just not the same so the throughput on transactions right now is roughly 20 to 30 maybe 15 for bitcoin but 15 to, to 30 transactions per second um the goal for worldwide computational ability if everything was to be put on blockchain which is not really necessary but if you're to put everything on the blockchain you might need a million transactions per second and we're at roughly 30 right now and if you wanted to put only all financial transactions on blockchain, then you need roughly 200,000 computations per second. But if, if Ethereum, which is way beyond financial transactions, it's a lot of uh, business in, and uh, technology and programming transactions as well, for Ethereum to be a global blockchain, 
and dominate all computing technology. It needs to be able to process probably 500,000 transactions a second. I'm just making up that number, but there's a lot more business transactions that go on than financial transactions. So whenever you, st financial, it's a limited purpose sending money. Business stuff, uh, there's a lot of times when you're on a web browser and browsing the web, you're sending a transaction back and forth if that web browser was on the Brave, not not today, but the Brave system that was run on Ethereum. Um, I don't know what that's called. I'm sure there's a startup for that. I forget about all these things. Uh, there's a lot more on the Ethereum platform than what the ICOs might indicate. Um, there's a lot of things that are not up for outside investment. They are fully supported by private investment. So you don't, so you hear less about that. I think one, um, one of them is Akasha, which is like an Ethereum Facebook. So you can imagine every like, every time you talk on Facebook, that's effectively a transaction. And so Ethereum naturally has a much higher demand for transactions since it's set up to be a business platform in addition to currency, whereas, Ether whereas Bitcoin is pretty much exclusively currency. So that's, that's uh, dealing with a few uh, issues in the marketplace. Um, but back to mining, <laughs> which was the purpose, right? So I keep looking down. I'm not really looking at anything. So let's go back to mining. But I wanted to talk about, I wanted to, to go over the ASICs and how Litcoin and, uh, Litecoin and Bitcoin used the ASICs system. And pretty much all your alts and everything else will use normal graphics cards. So I'm going to go through some uh, photos here. Let's see if I can make this full screen easily. Nope, I'm not going to even try. So I'm going to go some, through some photos here of the things that we're looking at over the weekend. Um, all right, my computer will bug out if I make this full screen, I'm sure. So here is essentially what the complete unit will look like. So you can see here you got the wood over here. And in a normal computer, you would call this the computer case. But the difference between, uh, I'll talk a little quieter, I know the sound is sensitive. So a computer case might ordinarily cost you about 80 bucks. This little wood structure costs about 80 bucks as well. If you built it yourself, it's probably $20. But you'd have to make all the measurements, etc. So what we'll end up having, having is your motherboard which is if you are thinking about getting into mining, uh, getting the proper motherboard is essentially the most important step. And once you find the proper motherboard, then you just find parts that work with it and you'll more or less be fine. So, so here's the motherboard and it will just sit out in the open like this on this little wood structure, a couple inches off the ground, you know, for, so water or air can, can pass through it. It'll have a, um, what is this called right now? I'm just, I'm going to call it the power box. But it will have the, oh gosh. Anyways, I'm just going to call it the power box. It will have, anyways, it'll have the, uh, the power unit, the power box, just out in the open like this, and it has a giant fan on top. And then these here, are your graphics cards and these uh, graphics cards could be used for uh, playing video games they could be used for watching movies on your computer and super high def like if you had a 52 inch TV and you wanted to watch movies from your computer to your 52 inch TV then you'd probably need a graphics card or if you play video games at high at high resolution but this is essentially exactly how it'll look when it's gonna be done there will be cords going everywhere of course um, there will not really be a monitor. There will be a cheap, crappy one. There will be a cheap, crappy, um, a cheap and crappy uh, mouse and everything. Um, but you don't really need that. You could have ten of these and just share one monitor and one mouse between each. And there will be a USB drive that will serve as the hard drive. So it will just be a uh, uh, this thing here will be the the hard drive to the mining computer and so you just need a small little flash drive it needs to be able to hold uh, it doesn't really need to be able to hold 128 
gigabytes of, of uh, memory, but you might want to get a 64 or a 128 gigabyte flash drive, and uh, that will be that will hold and store everything on the on the system. And you do that because one is cheap and easy. You don't you know you just use the flash drive and you have to get these little USB connectors. But secondly, because um, you just don't need to store that much for to download and, and mine on the to to download the entire uh, Bitcoin blockchain, it does take up some space. To download the entire Ethereum blockchain, it does take up some space. But what most people do is something called a mining pool. And um, if you mine Bitcoin and Ethereum by yourself, then one, you're at a small disadvantage because the other miners have uh, roughly three iterations to try to steal the discovery you made from you. So uh, you mine, you push out your discovery, and uh, you, you push it out. And then if someone else discovers it, Within, uh, for Ethereum, if someone else discovers it within about three minutes of you, or Bitcoin, if someone else discovers it within about 30 minutes of you, and they are bigger, like let's pretend I own 1,000 of these ASICs or graphics card miners. Um, if I own 1,000 of these and I discover it, I'm going to push it all out. I'm going to push it to all 1,000 immediately. And then um, 30 minutes later, uh, 100,000 people will have my discovery. Whereas if you're an individual and you make a discovery, you'll push it out to uh, three people and then they'll push it out till 10 and then they'll push it out to, uh, let's just call it a thousand at this point. So 30 minutes later are for Bitcoin or three minutes later for Ethereum, not 30, that, that's wrong in terms of my times there. I'm way off there, but ignore all that for now. But so, uh, but all the same. Um, they will have some, it might be more like 15 seconds for Ethereum and more like five minutes for Bitcoin, but all the same. Uh, you won't get up to their, they start off at the level that might take you 15 seconds or a few minutes to get to because they just own so many and thus they can push it out faster. Um, but anyways, moving on here. So this is kind of what it'll look like. Uh, our user here, our, our participant, was super excited to get this done. Okay, and here are the here is um, some more on the. Okay, here we go. Yeah. Okay, and here's some more uh, pictures of the system. So again, this is the box. This is the giant fan. So you won't get a normal computer fan. The main things you're going to buy is called power supply, not the power box. The main things you're going to buy are the power supply, uh, well, the motherboard first. You buy the motherboard first. Um, you'll need a power supply appropriate for the motherboard. Then you're going to buy a lot of graphics cards. And then you're going to buy a few little connectors is essentially the purchases you make. The main thing that you will not buy is a computer, a CPU fan or a, uh, a hard drive. You won't buy a hard drive in the normal sense. You'll just get these little flash drives, and these little flash drives. A lot of people aren't, a lot of people who don't uh, are not techie people. So Windows will not work on this little flash drive, but Ubuntu, Linux, Tails, all those kind of systems will work on this little flash drive. So there's a lot of operating systems that are much quicker, but they do a lot less, and they're less uh, user friendly than Windows. Um, Ubuntu, Linux, Tails, those are some of them. I've used them. They're actually not so bad to use. They have graphics and things, and you can click around and do stuff. But um, all the same. Just people aren't aware of them. And it, that's all you need in order to mine for the most part. Oh, um, and discussing about why you didn't need a big hard drive. So most people will pool mine to uh, not not have the chance of getting their lottery winnings stolen like finding the, the new block so if you find the new block or the new ethereum block and you win the pool then you get roughly sixty thousand dollars it might be thirty thousand but it's it's quite a lot of money thirty to sixty thousand dollars but if you do it by yourself you might only win once every two or three or four or ten years or whatever the case so a lot of people will pool and they'll get with let's just say a thousand other miners and this way they don't have to worry about the thing where someone could get pushed out faster than them and then um, 
their winnings are more consistent, way more consistent. And also, when it comes to downloading the blockchain, they don't have to grab everything. Hold on just a second, I'll be right back. Bitcoin about mining. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, anyways, moving on. So this is just how we put the uh, processor, the motherboard down in the box fan there. This here is a close-up on the motherboard. I just wanted to do you to <laughs> just so you know, there's a little video. Got it. Yeah, but not not a big deal. But all right. So this is the motherboard. Just wanted you to see it. This is where the processor. Uh, yeah, the processor will go. And you will have to buy a processor when you set up your mining equipment. Um, this here are where the graphics cards go. So you'll have one graphics card which goes here, which you'll not, you'll probably not put one in there, but you might. But you can put that in there just to start with just one graphics card. But if you have eight or 16 or whatever the case may be, those graphics cards will have a converter that go from here down to this. And they essentially do that because, uh, frankly, I'm not 100% sure why, but I'll just assume you don't need all these in order to just mine the Bitcoins, which is, this is called a H81 Pro Bitcoin uh, motherboard, let's say, from AS Rock or whatever the case. So this, I think this is called a 16 pin and this is called four pin connect, four pins. So you'll have to get a converter all your graphics cards will come made to fit this here. So you'll have to get a, get a converter to convert from 16 to four pins. And then uh, down here, for those who have never seen or, or assembled a computer, it's relatively easy. You know, assembling furniture, assembling computers um, with a little bit, uh, you gotta do a little bit more tech stuff. You don't need to really worry about shocking the system and and all that kind of stuff or not touching any of the metal parts you can really just touch them just fine uh, don't be you know discharge any static you have don't be uh, trying to rub your hair with a balloon to to do it or whatever but um, all the all the same you'll be fine this here is where the RAM goes for those that don't know you just pop the RAM in there so you will have to buy some RAM I forgot about that I, I can't recall if you need a lot of RAM for mining you don't Okay, so you don't need right. So you don't so you don't need a lot of RAM for mining, but you do need some, but four. Definitely get at least four gigabits of RAM, so you can be on the 64 processing systems. If you have two or le three, two or one RAM, then you're on 32-bit processing systems. So you want four gigabytes of RAM here. Um, I that I can't recognize what that is. It looks like HDMI. Um, systems, but this here is where you'll put your uh, your USB connectors. So you might have a, I think that's right. So you'll have a little uh, USB pins, pop it into there, and then it'll come out with a USB slot. And that's where you'll put your flash drive into, which will be your hard drive. It's also where you'll put your mouse to and keyboard to uh, use your mouse and keyboard. And then you'll, um, okay, well, I'll move on there. I, th I think that's all your USB is for. And then, okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, here's some more close-ups. Here's here's the processor unit here, and it's going to just slide in here. And I don't think the processor has to be very powerful either. I think the RAM and the processor and the computer um, can be relatively weak. I wish I had the numbers here, but I don't have the numbers on me right now as to the numbers that we got. Okay, I took a lot of close-ups here. I don't know why. <laughs> just getting ready to put it on. So here is some thermal gel. Um, today, most of your things will come with enough thermal gel to be fine, but you might want to buy some thermo gel, uh, anyways. Um, for those who did not, those who have not put computers together in a while, it used to be really uh, scary to put on the processor. Now it's relatively easy. The main thing when putting together a computer uh, from scratch is that there's a lot of fine pins and you don't want to bend any of them. It's fine for you to touch things, try not to drop it, but if any of these pins get bent, then and then it just might not work or you might have a bad pin connection and your computer might just short on occasion or it'll just go slower, something like that. 
or it just won't fit. So in this case, we've put the processor down and this is called a heat, a heat sink. You'll also need a heat sink. Every computer needs those. You'll pretty much have that as suggested by if you buy a, a, processor, a processor. So we put the, the processor down, it went down easy. We put uh, this little thing slid over it to lock it in place. And uh, this was actually our user's first time building a computer and then we popped down the heat sink on top of that. So this is how it looked when it was all done there. Um, some more pictures, I think. <laughs> so, and then you can see how we got that heat sink here and then it just plugged it into there. And on there, I believe it says uh, either computer fan or heat seek fan. So most of these things are kind of labeled. And then in terms of when you're plugging things in, you want the words on the thing to, to go to the outside of the motherboard or the out, go face out. And that's a great way to, to know which way to plug it in. And this is, this is essentially all you're doing when it comes to popping a computer together, this type of behavior. You put the processor in there, you put the fan on top, you plugged it in, you're done. Uh, this is a close-up of the motherboard box. Here's just another view. And you can see with this little thing here, I, again, this, is, this giant wood thing is your case. So um, your case is going to be really huge. So we have all these... Uh, these eight or whatever graphics cards on top and they're going to be put up on top here with a lot of room for that air to blow and your your two power supplies this is what will catch fire if you don't get strong enough power supply so you don't want your power supply running at a hundred percent use all the time you prefer it at 70 percent or 80 percent use and that will prevent potentials for fire and then likewise, you want to have good ventilation, uh, which which is a box fan uh, for anyone who mines. You want to use a box fan to mine with. And then preferably, um, you you want to keep your uh, your mining equipment in a, a area that's free of dust and an area that is preferably just probably not in your house or cool. So uh, we're going to try to put this one in a garage and we might put in an air filter on the box on the back of the fo box fan just pop an air filter on the back to try to remove some of the dust or have a dust collector or put some other kind of stuff around there just so that um, air is outside air is not flowing into the unit all the time it's it's this uh, air that's going through the box fan with a filter attached to the back it's probably sufficient to keep a, a dust free environment relatively so again, this is kind of how it look, and you see how it's got these 16 pins up here, and we'll get the connectors to, pro to pop it in down there. Again, um, oh, so here's a look at some of the graphics cards we got. We got one that was 500 bucks, I believe, or $400 on eBay, and then a set of five that was $200 each. And the big time miners are gonna grab this stuff from Alibaba, and they'll grab a thousand of them. But, uh, they're not really doing the graphics cards, they're doing the ASICs for the most part. Um, but we got this $500 one just to give it a go at the start and then these $200 ones to see how it went as a pack of five. Some other parts were still in order. And I believe that's the most, oh yeah, okay, there you go. So this is kind of one of the more complete packages. So we got the processor in there, we got the fan attached. Um, this here is going to the power supply. So that's the power supply plugged into the motherboard right there. And here you got the uh, USB connectors going to this mouse. And here it is up and running. He's got a mouse, he's got a keyboard, he's got, uh, I believe it's Ubuntu that he's using. Um, anyways, the graphics cards are not in there, the power supply is behind the monitor here. Um, but I believe that's everything in there and he's got a flash drive somewhere here powering all this and so once you pop the uh, flash and uh, Ethernet cord somewhere I'm sure so once you put in this Ubuntu software and your Ethernet cord this stuff for those who are computer savvy this stuff is meant to be remotely managed which means that if you're on your um, office computer you could I will call it hacking for simple purposes. You could hack into this system and make all the changes you want to uh, using your Ethernet cord to the 
flash drive hard drive but to the flash drive without another without a keyboard mouse and monitor dedicated to this system so in theory you could have uh, and we might eventually have but you could have ten of these things essentially cooled off by one or two box fans without any monitors keyboards or mouses attached to them only flash drives processors heat sinks for each one and all the little connection cords um, and it, I believe he uses uh, something here to to uh, remotely manage this stuff and also in, and I'll see if he talks about that more but yeah so that was the follow-up to the mining I wanted you all to see kind of like what it looked like what assembling a miner kind of looked like and also the difference between um, mining somewhat professionally semi-professionally versus mining casually if you have one of these in, com in your computer especially if it's an expensive one you can mine casually and, and see how it goes but your electrical cost is probably quite high the advantage is you're mining all these alt coins which I believe we're doing SIA primarily um, so that's that and then I also wanted to uh, so this uh, I want to talk about some other things uh, related to mining real quick but so there's so there's other ways to mine um, or other other ways that blockchains call their mining another way to mine is with staking they'll call it or money um, you could call it money mining and dash is an example of that Monero Zcash I probably haven't used it but I believe Monero dash are ones and one that I did was called Neos okay. but uh, all the same and in, in the staking you're kind of mining but you're not mining with computer power you're mining with money and they'll pay an interest rate and it's usually a really high a relatively high interest rate maybe 10 to 30 percent of your initial investment and uh, that interest rate is about equivalent to what they might pay for miners had they purchased computer miner people and the reason Bitcoin and Litecoin use uh, the old mining systems of, of generating this hash power and all this stuff is because the goal was to get 10,000 computers onto a network. You get 10,000 computers, uh, they just pick this number, and they call the network secure. So back uh, th just even a year ago, even a year ago, it was uh, extremely costly compared to their market cap for any of these coins to simply purchase their own computers and use them. But now uh, Ethereum, because I, I just harassed them a little bit, but the Ethereum Foundation, for example, they're set up on an altcoin system. So they're paying extremely high prices to their miners, which all your altcoins, you gotta have some reason that they're not doing Bitcoin or something else, so you, so you pay a little bit more. So Ethereum is currently paying $1 billion a year at the current rate. But they're paying a billion dollars a year to uh, power 10,000 computers, which comes out to $100,000 per computer. Now our system costs about 2,000, as you see there, it could mine Ethereum. And the Ethereum Foundation could buy it from us. And with the electrical storage management costs, maybe you say $5,000 for the year, or 10,000 maybe for the year to, to support this computer are 10% of what they're currently paying to support their, their network. Well, the reason for that is because at one time, uh, this number of, um, ooh, so, so uh, this number of, oh gosh, I'm gonna have to calculate that. So, so this number might be $100 million to support 10,000 computers uh, for, for the Ethereum and Bitcoin blockchains. Well, at one time, $100 million was a very significant percent of the market cap or the expenses for the Ethereum Foundation. It's probably still very significant. However, the uh, Ethereum uh, stakeholders and so forth, the people who own Ethereum coins and everybody else and, and the foundation, you could say effectively, they're currently paying $1 billion a year to support these computers. And this is because they have not moved over to the proof of stake system. This is something in terms of uh, long-term value. Ethereum essentially has to really push toward that proof of stake system incredibly quickly. Um, or simply just stop 
paying the miners and purchase 10,000 computers for 100 million or whatever the case may be and and do it themselves um that's my opinion um but five months ago six months ago when ethereum was going and but five wait yeah, five months ago or six months ago when Ethereum was doing its uh, proof of stake discussions, um, the market cap was way less. And so 100 million was quite a bit. But, but, but now that the market cap is so high, the 100 million is way less. Uh, it's very cost effective at the current time. Okay. Because um, it's, it's set to percent, it's set to pay out a percent of the market cap. And Ethereum is effectively set to pay out roughly 12% of the market cap. Um, and if the market cap is $25 billion, well, 12% of that is like 2.5% $2.5 billion or whatever the case. It's, it's just quite a lot. Uh, Bitcoin likewise pays out, it pays out less because it was set up uh, earlier, it's older, blah, blah, blah. It didn't have to use the altcoin pricing that, Bit that Ethereum was using when it first started and is still using currently until... Um, wait, hold up, what? Nope. Oh, you really got, okay, good. All right, so, <laughs> thanks, man. You're good to go. But yeah, so, so this is, uh, so this, so this is, uh, why Ethereum is overpaying so much. Uh, Bitcoin currently is paying out maybe a billion dollars, maybe, uh, 700 million, I don't know to its miners, it's roughly half, maybe a third of what Ethereum pays out. But Ethereum was set up on the altcoin pricing and Bitcoin um, was designed to do what it's doing. Um, eventually Ethereum's gonna get away from it. Tezos has got away from it. Our Tezos is never going to have it when it when it launches Antcoin, A-N-S, which is gonna be rebranded in EO, NEO. Uh, that is also using a proof of stake system or not paying the miners or you could say mining in-house um, It's probably better to think about as in-house mining. It's easier to think of and then in terms of other types of mining So the ones so there's the mining that we talked about here, which is uh, Computer processor mining, which is what your altcoins and bitcoins kind of use and then there's the money or stake mining which is what uh, dash Zcash Monero, NEOS, the, the one I, I grabbed a little bit, but it's just a little penny stock. Do not grab it just because I did it at all, at all. Uh, it's a little bit of, all, all those types of things are a little bit of Ponzi's. Now they're incredibly stable. We'll talk about that later, but all the same. Uh, those things use uh, money or stake mining. And then uh, Siacoin or uh, Gollum, they use a different, and, and steam it, they kind of use a different type of mining. So Steemit, if you want to mine Steemit, all you got to use is their Facebook or their Reddit network and make posts. And you make a post and you get paid a penny, two pennies, maybe a thousand dollars if it's a really popular post. And then it, uh, for Saya, or, or Saya, you rent out your hard drive. So if you have a 500 gigabyte hard drive, but you only use 150 gig, then you can rent out, let's just call it 300 gigabytes and they'll pay you a couple of pennies for every day that you do that. Or for Gollum, they use your processing unit and you rent that out. So when you're not using your processing power on your computer, Gollum uses it instead and they pay you a couple of pennies for that. And these prices of course will fluctuate. So the main reason I wanted to discuss that in terms of uh, when, when people think about mining coins, they often think about rates of return and they often think about ways to get into coins without having to purchase them. So there's ways to mine coins with hardware units. There's ways to mine coins with your your monetary units or commitment commitment of monetary units. And there's also ways to mine coins via participation in the systems like the Facebook and Reddit copycats, Steemit, Akasha probably as well. I don't know. And then there'll be um, and then there's also ways to uh, mine coins via renting out parts of your computer that are not currently in use, your processing unit and your hard drive. These are things that will become more popular as uh, the altcoins develop. So anyways, that was the follow-up tutorial, follow-up to the mining discussion, and we'll talk about some more about it today probably. 
All right, thanks for uh, watching for all those who stuck it out. <laughs> and I hope you learned something and maybe you get to mining. And if you're in Knoxville, Tennessee and want to pitch in on a bigger mining rig, you're free to do so. All right, and, and you'll get profits from it. All right, talk to you later, bye.